Welcome back to Loyalty Leaders Podcast. I'm David Feldman, Global Chair of Loyalty Summit. And today I'm joined by Phil Gunter and Keith Tan. And we're going to be talking about Virgin Australia's relaunch as a full service airline uh, in 2011 and the very aggressive status match campaign that Virgin Australia launched in concert with relaunching its frequent flyer program. Uh, So welcome to Phil and Keith. Good morning, David. Thanks, David. Good morning. And for those who don't know, Phil Gunter um, was the um, the head of the Velocity, the Virgin Australia's Velocity Frequent Flyer program at the time, um, and designed um, and relaunched the Frequent Flyer program and the status match that went with it. Keith, uh, for our Australian listeners, Keith is a is a well known loyalty leader and practitioner in Australia, um, but at the time was working with Phil on the Velocity relaunch team. So. Uh, both uh, Phil and Keith have joined us today and allowed me to pick their brains um, and just to, to set the scene a little bit. And I'll, I'll get you guys to kind of, you know, obviously you're at the cold face working through this. You can expand on the details, but sort of for the benefit of our non-Australian listeners or those that sort of don't quite remember all the way back. But at the time, Virgin Australia was relaunching as a full service airline in direct competition to Qantas, which was the established full service mainline carrier in Australia. And obviously wanting to compete with Qantas Frequent Flyer, again, a very, very well-established mainline Frequent Flyer program. And so the at the time, Virgin Australia rebranded because it was Virgin Blue, rebranded into Virgin Australia. There was new logos, new brand design, all the rest of it, new positioning in the marketplace, and came with that the relaunch of the Frequent Flyer program with a lot of world-first and world-leading innovations in there as well, which I'll won't still Phil's thunder. I'll let him sort of rattle off some of those. But you weren't content with that because having relaunched the new product, you wanted to you wanted to very aggressively go after some high value Qantas customers um, and launched um, a you know I, I think at the time was what was the world's biggest um, status match campaign. Um, and you know, I, I want to. I have a lot of questions about wanting to sort of get into the background of how you went about that and what the results were and all the rest. But before we get into too much detail, um, Phil and Keith, um, can you sort of tell us a little bit more about the relaunch of the airline and the frequent flyer program? Cool. Yeah. So the airline, as you as you mentioned, went from Virgin Blue, which was fun and and, and sexy uh, mid tier, I guess, wasn't quite a low cost carrier. Relaunches Virgin Australia in May. Um, and it was a beautiful planes, beautiful product. Um, and the frequent flyer uh, launched in, we launched in August. Um, but the, the background behind that, we did a lot of research of why people were choosing, consistently choosing Qantas over Virgin, uh, even after the, the product relaunch. And the number one reason came back was Qantas frequent flyer status. It came back consistently. So the, when we did the first lot of research, it came back this Qantas frequent flyer. But then we pushed further. It wasn't the points. It was the status. The, the, the members that had status of any tier with Qantas were just not considering Virgin as, as an alternative. So we knew we had to be brave and bold and uh, do two things. One, we had to launch a program, which was on things that we could be better on, or it was better. And then separately, we had to find a way of unlocking the people that were rusted on and get, like remove that rust and bring them across. So that, so that was, the, that was the, the whole plan was to, was to launch. And we did some good stuff. So a lot of the stuff we did at back on the program with the family benefits, with the pooling and, and the parental leave and, and the fly ahead, a lot of that stuff is only now becoming common. But we were doing mm-hmm. it back in 2011. Um, so before before we jump into too much detail, Phil, can I can I just sort of ask you sort of some top line results? Um, you know, when you when you decide when you made the decision to go after the Qantas frequent flyer customers, and based on that research, decided or understood that to do so, you're going to have to make it easy for high value status holders of Qantas to be able to move across and give Virgin a try. What were sort of the some of the end results of of all that effort? Well, we we do claim it's the world's most successful status match because of this. Right. So we brought in 50,000, it's more than 50,000 uh, high value customers, which was, 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 was fantastic. But what was really fantastic was there were 20,000 of them went on and flew enough to maintain their, their status that they then took the credit cards out and it completely transformed the performance and scale of the program, 
and the, the airline. So the airline achieved its aim within the next three years of doubling its, its share of corporates, which is what we were trying to do this for. And Velocity, uh, over the next 18 months, tripled its EBIT. So we tripled the EBIT of the program. Uh, and we all know pro programs are profitable. So we, we really did kick goals. We, we delivered for the airline by, by unlocking double the, the uh, market share of corporates. And we delivered from the, from the business because we, we tripled our, our um, profit. Um, you know, and it's interesting you mentioned credit cards there, Phil, because, of course, you know, 10 years or 13 years ago, um, you know, it was only, you know, us nerds and geeks in the industry that really, you know, paid attention to airline frequent flyer programs and, and co-brand take up and, 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 and revenue from co-brands and things like that. Now, of course, it's passe and everybody, you know, it's, it's mainstream, it's mainstream uh, awareness now in, in the community. Um, no, no, you know, perhaps no thanks to COVID in, in a lot of ways with that. But um, it, it's, it's, it's just interesting in terms of how important that was even going back over a decade now in terms of measuring the success of, an, I mean, effectively what was an acquisition campaign, um, you know, to tie into the brand relaunch. Um, we mentioned, um, you know, some of the new, you know, world-leading uh, features and benefits that accompanied the relaunch of the Freak and Flyer program. And Phil, you sort of mentioned family pooling and things like that. Can you talk to some of those other sort of um, things that were developed at the time that, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, as a, I was a Qantas frequent flyer at the time, I was a, a target of this campaign for sure. But I mean, I, I remember, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of bang and pizzazz and, and, and stuff like that going on with the relaunch of Velocity frequent flyer. And it was quite attention getting. And, you know, I know people raised their eyebrows. It was like, wait, you're, you're introducing what benefit? Oh, yeah. Well, 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 we were lucky because we, well, we had a good foundation. So Velocity had some great foundations with the, with the dynamic earn, um, sorry, dynamic burn and, and the revenue accrual. Um, but we, we looked at everything root to branch. Um, so the rewards, for instance, we, 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 we moved from, uh, from uh, dynamic rewards into the hybrid so that you, so people could have confidence in, and they could get their, their, um, their fixed price rewards as well as on the flexibility. And again, You've seen some of the stuff that Qantas is doing now that we were doing that back then, that we, that we, were, we were enabling people to, to have that flexibility with, with the, the, the confidence of, of the price. Um, um, even the policies, the policies we put in place, um, they were just humanistic, um, sensible policies that, that um, you know, if you were a platinum, we would lead with a yes. Um, a lot of this stuff is it's really, really sensible, but to do that, we had to, we had to, engage the whole airline so that when a, when a a, freak, a a platinum member say did have an interaction with a staff member the staff member is ready with a if we can say yes we will and i think both um from an internal and external perspective there was just so much excitement at the time it was probably the most exciting time for um australian aviation for a while we had a dominant um you know airline in Qantas. And finally, Australian consumers had a choice. So I think with with the relaunch of the program happening shortly after the relaunch of the airline, there was just so much um, buzz and excitement and, and a lot of media attention, certainly. Um, but part of that was, was people internally um, embracing the changes and and just you know getting really excited about it and and um, they were willing to do you know work long hours and and just you know um, push forward with the forward momentum for the airline. You know, it's, it's interesting you say that, Keith, because I'm, I mean, I, I remember at the time, I mean, as you say, sort of the the airline rebranded a few months ahead of the frequent flyer program relaunching, and there really was, I mean airlines around the world you know get a get a bad rap and you know often deservedly so you know most 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 airline passengers don't have status most airline passengers you know you you go fly somewhere i mean if maybe it's for vacation maybe it's for work maybe it's to see a sick relative it's generally speaking it's not a fun experience you know there is friction at every point in the process right you've got traffic to the airport then there's parking at the airport then they're all getting dropped off curbside after the huge wait to get get there then there's lines to check in. Then there's lines for security. And then if you're lucky, you get touched up. If you're not lucky, you're just stuck waiting in line for two hours. Uh, if you, you know, then you've got to go to the gate. Then you're standing around. Then there's delays. I mean, 
we all know how this works, right? It's generally speaking, not a pleasant experience. And then you get on a plane and if you're lucky, you depart roughly on time and it's incident free. And then you get to your vacation uh, location and or family, you know, reunion or whatever it is. And you get to enjoy your time at your destination. That's assuming that the 10 million things beforehand didn't all go wrong. But so we can sort of understand why, given that dynamic, most people don't have positive interactions with airlines and you know, regardless of where you are around the world. But Virgin Australia, dis- even despite the snazzy and fun Virgin branding, at the time, there really was this buzz and it was palpable for customers. You know, everybody had a smile on their face. Everybody was excited. Everybody was was super enthusiastic about promoting the brand. And as a customer, as a passenger, you walked in where they had status or you had no status. That, and you felt genuinely welcomed and, and everybody was really proud um, of, of the new branding at the time. And it's interesting because if I remember correctly at this time frame, on the other flip side, Qantas, the other major airline in Australia, which was your bigger uh, competitor, they were having some issues, whether it was some safety issues with the A380 groundings after the incident in Singapore, there was industrial relations issues and strikes, and there was another grounding in relation to that. So, you know, I... I mean, timing is everything, right? But uh, to some degree, I feel like, you know, Qantas was coming out of a bit of a bad run of things, not necessarily all their fault, but from passengers' perspective, Qantas customers had had a number of disruptions. And then there was this really fun rebranding on the Virgin side. Um, And so that leads me into, I want to segue into the status match campaign that you launched. And Phil, I appreciate what you were saying about the why you felt you needed to do that. But if I recall correctly, and you guys can fill in the gaps because you guys were doing this, um, but I remember it was big. There were billboards. You guys had setups and pop-ups at shopping malls and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess, the decision, the business decision to kind of go big and and maybe some, my, my memory might be failing me, but some of the other things you sort of did to really go out there and go with a big bang? Oh, it is great context because it was the reason we went big. There's the fact that we 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 built the the you know, we bought the product, um, but Qantas had gifted as an opportunity, a short term opportunity, and there they, Qantas is a great airline, right? So we knew that they wouldn't be um, under a cloud for too long. So there was a window that people were a little bit jaded with them. There was some very public bad news that they were getting consistently, and so we just said we're, we're going to do it. We're going to go big. So the offer itself was 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 very generous or, or it was generous. It was, we'll match you tier for tier with a straight 12 months, very clean. Uh, um, but then they, we, we, we promoted it everywhere through, through all airline channels, through the airport and et cetera. Um, but we, like you say, we spent money above the line. Um, and in, and then we, we put stalls in shopping malls in the Westfields so that people could come along, see it and apply at the time. So, but it was, it was backed up by process. So where you saw it, you could apply, where it be in the right. range, in the, in the mall. Um, we had people, as we, we know some of these people, driving a long way just to, just to apply in person and, and get their, get their um, status. And, and Keith, you know, you were, you were, you know, sleeves rolled up, you know, working, you know, with hand in hand with, with Phil on this uh, at the time. Did you want to add anything sort of in terms of some of the things that you were working on? You know, again, in sort of in terms of this this huge big campaign that you guys had to pull together. Yeah, so one one of the big things we did was the um, offering instant status match, um, you know, uh, in person, as Phil mentioned. Um, we did it in airline lounges and in um, at the Westview shopping mall as well. Um, we th- we thought you know this this has to be um, a bit like status match campaigns existed around the world in some way shape or form at a time, and a normal process is you you get people to fill in the form online, um, fill in their frequent flyer details, provide evidence of the current status, and then they they wait a few weeks and and a way to go, but but this had to be something different. And so we decided to set up a presence um, in every single Virgin Australia lounge around the country, um, as well as in Westview, where you could come in and if you provided your evidence of your current um, frequent flyer status, 
we would offer you an instant status match on the spot. Um, we, we would, you know, we would have to do some processing in the background, but you got a temporary card and temporary luggage tags and, and people were really, um, stoked about it. Um, like I had so many wonderful conversations with, um, all our frequent flyers, um, about it. They, they were all a bit shocked. Like, that's it. Like I, I I'm now velocity go instantly. I'm like, yep, yeah, enjoy. Um, and what was really fun at a t- I had literally joined the airline um, that same month, and and uh, I had moved up from Melbourne to to Brisbane to work for um, Virgin Australia, and and then Phil told me, "Oh, Keith, surprise! You're going back to uh, Melbourne. We're going to put you at the Melbourne Lounge to uh, manage this status match campaign there." So it. As far as an introduction to the airline goes, it was the best orientation. Meeting, meeting um, all our wonderful frequent flyers, and and you know, understanding like what makes them tick and and what what they're most uh, excited about. And you know, and, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. But I mean, before this big campaign, you know, I mean the the old way of doing it, which was the way sort of every airline did it with a status match, was you know you'd either there might be a form online or maybe there was something that had an email address or maybe nothing was listed and it was up to a potential interested customer to email the frequent flyer team and to say hey i'm interested in the status match is there something you can do you know here's a copy of my frequent flyer card from another airline you know blah 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 and sometimes you know and sometimes you got a response sometimes you didn't sometimes that response would take a long time um you know and and he was, as you say, literally, you know, pressing the flesh with people to, to be in front of people, to, to take that engagement right then and there. I mean, uh, this is, you know, 13 years ago, but I mean, I remember, I, I think I applied sometime in that first 10 days or, or something like that. I mean, I, I it was huge. You know, I, I think I thought at the time, oh, yeah, this is interesting. Okay, no problem. Sort of put it on my mental to-do list. But I mean, I remember there was a huge buzz. You know, everybody was talking about it. And I was like, oh, I, I guess I should, I should get onto this. And um, I'm I'm pretty sure I had my my new status upgraded in my you know Virgin profile you know within a day or two it, it was pretty quick. Um, but how did that? I mean, this was a huge campaign. I, I think you know as as time goes by, we forget just how big a campaign this was. How did you guys go? I mean, you guys were a pretty small team uh, at Velocity uh, at the time. Um, how did you go in terms of managing those sort of volumes? Well. We're giving you the good already, but there's the bad and this is the ugly. Right? So <laughs> reality was that we, we were totally overwhelmed. So as Keith mentioned, the team was sent to the to the lounges. So so we, we, were, we were manning the lounges um, and uh, you, know, you, you needed few people to, to, to get through the, the, the shifts. Um, mm-hmm. But the the process, as you mentioned, David, the process was send the, for, for, send the, the details online give us a beat uh your images etc the normal data match process right but the volumes came in you must have you must have applied quite quickly because at the beginning we were processing them really quickly that was our thing um but the volumes came in we were overwhelmed we just could not get through the volumes and the, and the, and the, basically sadly the, the waiting list blew up and we towards the end of the campaign we were, we were at four to six weeks before we mm. could get back to people um, which just was not the experience we wanted. Uh, that we wanted people to be overwhelmed, be be surprised how good we were. And six weeks before they get a, a response was just just not not not, not cutting it. Um, you know, I mean, I I think I think that's right. I mean, I think we we talk a lot about negative experiences, right? Or removing friction. I mean, we you know, and we sort of tease some of those brand new innovations. You know, like the family pooling at the time, which really was truly you know innovative you know, the hybrid award chart and, you know, extra uh, availability awards. But, you know, you guys, did, uh, there, were, there, were, there were dozens of other innovations you guys had. I mean, you had guaranteed reward seats. You know, you had the, the you know, like so that a family with kids that wanted to travel during school holidays when typically there would be no availability, you had the ability to, well, I think it was once a year or something, you had the ability to basically say, hey, I want to go on a family trip and, you could force open some some award seats. Um, there were things like the upgrade certificates. Again, they were they were they were very new and innovative at the time. Um, you know, other airlines had done some version of upgrade certificates in the past, but not like you had done. Where you know all sort of platinum members got these certificates, and and they were very easy to use and things like that. There, there were all these innovations that 
I felt as a customer were around removing friction, removing pain points, you know, ability to find award seats, ability to take the family on a, on a vacation, you know, because finding one award seat is fine. You want to find one for your spouse and the kids as well. All of a sudden that's a lot harder and everybody has those frustrations. And then, as you say, now that you have this introduction to the brand and you're waiting four to six weeks to come across and maybe six weeks later, the person isn't as excited to try. Maybe they had a flight coming up. They wanted to book in a few days time. And if you're not meeting that, that sort of that, that turnaround time, could I ask what other sort of learnings did you have? Or well, I mean, you talked about the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, we we talked about some of the good in terms of some of those financial results, and I think you said that a third of of, of people that matched actually went on to retain to fly enough to retain their status. So I mean, that was a, a huge win acquisition wise. Um, how about sort of other results? I mean, obviously, one third means there's two thirds of people remaining. And, you know, towards the end of the campaign, you had these big blowouts of four to six weeks. Can you talk about some of the sort of the other learnings that you had in terms of maybe results that weren't weren't as as flashy or things that if you could do it again, you'd do it differently? Well, for me, the big the big learning was speed. Mm-hmm. Right. So the, the people when we when it's all done, we look back. Uh, and it was roughly a third, third, third. A third of people is, is slightly over, like engaged properly, flew a lot, and 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 maintained it into the credit card and everything else. Right, a third of of them also flew a bit, um, and which they wouldn't have done before. And a third of people did nothing. Right? But when we got deeper into the analysis, it was really, really skewed by the, by the time to process. So the people that were processed quickly were massively more likely to have properly engage, and equally. The ones that did took four to six weeks, four four weeks and beyond, they, they, they were the ones that did absolutely nothing. We, just, we incurred cost of bringing them in um, and confirmed their, our theory was, it confirmed their assumption that the airline wasn't good enough. And so and so it's worse than doing nothing. So the, the, so we, the learning for us, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it and, and turn it around really, really quickly. Keith, did yeah. you want to add anything in terms of learnings and from your experience with that? Yeah, from from interacting with with these members literally at the co face in the lounge, a lot of them were flying or interacting with Virgin for the very first time. Um, they they weren't they weren't you know ex customers or or customers that had flew in Virgin a little bit. A lot of them were 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 touching the brand for the very first time, and this status match campaign was was their very first interaction with the airline. And so it, it doesn't surprise me that that's that you know people that were processed quickly were more engaged. Whereas the one that experienced that you know that extended delay were were just. Um, we're just uh, disengaged, but this is a good segue into um, into um, like why why we were overwhelmed as well. Mm-hmm. Remember, like going back a few minutes ago, we we mentioned that um, this status match happened at the same time as as the frequent flyer program relaunch. Um, I think I think looking back, we we would have allowed the the relaunch of the program to bed in before um, you know launching an ambitious such an ambitious status match campaign at, at a time when when our team you know needed to deliver and make sure everything was tickety boo and all systems go. We were simultaneously like you know doing making sure that that all the systems were were operating correctly with all the new benefits that you mentioned. And diverting resources to, um, you know, service customers for for the status match, and it wasn't just, you know, like a regular status match. This attracted so much demand and so much attention. So yeah, I think team capacity was was something that was, um, uh, you know, st- stretch at a time. Um, it was a very small team, and and yeah, like it it, it was it was um, not great at a time when we really needed to deliver. Um, and, and, and making sure that the program relaunch was going smoothly. That makes a lot of sense. Can I, can I ask, you know, um, we talk, you know, we've talked a lot about the speed of processing the status match. One of the other things that, that comes up, um, you know, in terms of when we talk, when we talk status matches nowadays, and, and for those that don't know, and I, I probably should have mentioned at the beginning, but, but Phil, I mean, I think I actually, I mean, I think this experience for Virgin Australia led to this, right? But but your 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 role today 
um, nowadays is, you know, you're part of the leadership at Lordy Status Co. You know, the, the, you guys founded statusmatch.com. Uh, um, and, you know, you've worked with a number of brands, you know, on status match strategies, you know, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I know that, you know, a lot of these, uh, these learnings from, you know, this sort of trial by fire at Verdict really, you know, formed a lot of your, you know, deep held views about, hey, you know what, this works, this doesn't. And, you know, with, we've got some deep experience with, with a lot of this, you know, uh, obviously with going back to Virgin Australia, but also you know, with quite a number of brands since then, speed to process is huge. That 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 constantly comes up in conversations. We know that. And, you know, and, and Keith, the brands you've worked with, brands I've worked with, this is always an issue, uh, is speed to process. The other issue that's probably equally as important that comes up is is fraud. Um, and I don't like using the word um, because people misuse that word all the time uh, with regard to loyalty programs. Nine out of 10 times, in my personal opinion, when people refer to fraud and loyalty programs, they're not referring to fraud. They're referring to people who poorly design promotional rules that customers then take advantage of in accordance with the published rules. That's not fraud. <laughs> that, that's mm. that's people do, doing exactly what you've gamified your program or your campaign. You've asked people to engage in that in a gamified way. They do that. And then you get upset that maybe you should have made the rules a little bit tighter. That's not fraud. But when it comes to status match, uh, status matching, there is some fraud. There is people who claim to have credentials and don't have them. There are people who have multiple accounts. You know, I guess the most obvious thing is, oh, send us a photo of your, you know, your Qantas Frequent Flyer card, for example. And it's not really my Qantas Frequent Flyer card. It's somebody else's um, Platinum Frequent Flyer card with my name on it. Or it's mine, but I've written Platinum instead of, you know, base member um, on it uh, as an example. Can you talk to me a little bit about your experience with this campaign in, in terms of, you know, uh, fraud? Was there fraud? Was there no fraud? You know, how did it affect things and sort of, Again, learnings and takeaways. There, there was definitely um, quite a bit of um, fraud because the verification process, as mentioned, is is you you are only required to send in um, a photo of your frequent flyer card, um, or in some cases, a screenshot of your you know online frequent flyer status from from the Qantas website or, or mm -hmm. whatever um, program that you belong to. Um, so in, in an age of uh, Photoshop, and this was 13 years ago, but Photoshop was very well developed at the time, um, there, there were, you know, people sending in um, uh, bogus, um, you know, credentials that they had clearly um, manipulated. Um, some some weren't obvious at all, and, and I'm sure, you know, um, because we had very um, limited means of verification, that there was no Gen AI back then to to determine whether someone has digitally altered their um, credentials. Um, but th there were a few that we picked up. They were clearly, you know, bad Photoshop um, artwork. Uh, but I'm sure there were there were there were many that 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 went through because um, they were just more competent Photoshoppers. You know, and and Phil, question question to you. I mean, it occurs to me a few things with this. I mean, number, I mean, again, you sort of said about a third, a third, a third in terms of general status match results in terms of the campaign. I mean, I also think when it comes to fraudsters in the sense of people photoshopping their fake credentials to get a status match, you know, I also wonder if there's maybe not as exactly thirds, but you know, third, 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 or quarter, quarter, quarter. Um, you know, in terms of different groupings within that as well, right? I mean, some people they don't have the credentials. Um, or maybe they were a platinum member, but it expired and they're changing the expiry date to show to pretend they're still current type thing, you know, mm -hmm. and you know what, they're sort of done with Qantas and they just want a fast start with Virgin, but then maybe those people might actually fly. They might still give you some business and that's business that you wouldn't have had before. And maybe even a subset of those will go on to actually be good, profitable customers. You know, I guess others, some of them, they'll do the match. They're not going to do anything with it. You send them a new card. You've incurred some nominal cost. Um, you know, n nominal hard cost in terms of sending them a card and some baggage tags or something, perhaps some more resource cost uh, in terms of processing it, but then they don't really give you any business on, on the tail end. And then I guess there's probably definitely a, a group of hardcore people that, you know, they get it, they don't, re they shouldn't have got it, they don't really give you profitable business, 
but mm. they're making sure that if they do give you ten dollars worth of business, they're taking a hundred dollars worth of lounge action, um, you know, and whatever other benefits at the same time. So they're truly unprofitable customers. I mean, I'm guessing there's a split, you know, maybe not nice and even groupings, but there's different people, right? No, the, the, you're, you're you're not wrong. It's very difficult, but it's, it's actually right today. It's not hard to uh, certainly pre data smash. It's not hard to identify fraud, right? Yeah. Um, back then it was it was difficult. Some of us keep says some of them were were, were obvious, um, mm-hmm. but we knew it was going on. The issue for us, the reality is, for us back then, it wasn't such a big issue because we had capacity in the system. Right? Yeah. So so we had we had. Uh, a lot of the, we built the lounges, so we had capacity in the lounges. So a few extra wasn't going to kill us. We had capacity in the premium cabins, so the upgrades yep. um, weren't going to kill us. Uh, if if you go to a, a normal airline where capacity is con- is contained um, and the challenge and, and, and in the, in your premium cabins and your lounges, etc., then people frauding the system to get in there and dis- displacing someone that has got the true yep. value is a problem. So. It, yeah, because it devalues the product for the profitable customer that you want to keep and you want to keep happy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and and that is those two things: the, the the problem of fraud and and the need for speed are exactly what to your point before is 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 why me, Mark, and Stuart did did get together. And think, well, what does the world need? And and thought about status match. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I know that I remember the conversations we, we, we had, you know, I mean, in, in my re- recent conversation with Mark, you know, we, we, we talked about this, you know, it was just like, yeah, everyone lamented the the fact that there was the whole process was full of friction. And, you know, to your, you opened this conversation for with saying your research was saying, I mean, it's, to me, it's very obvious to the three of us, it's very obvious, right? Um, and that is, is that if you're embedded and you have status with airline A, you know, mm-hmm. even if you're not necessarily the happiest with them even if it's this sort of you know inertia that's keeping you there you don't want to start with the other airline to try them out firstly they're an unknown quantity so you don't know if you're going to like them or they're going to work for you they're not going to work for you so you know you you want to give them a test run but the problem is is two things number one you don't want to start at the bottom of the the ladder and work your way up because nobody wants to be without that priority access once you get used to it again the airport is a horrible experience so all those priority things and benefits, they remove a lot of those pain points. Secondly, though, the problem is, if I'm, to use this example, Qantas, if I'm a Qantas frequent flyer, every flight I take is helping me retain my Qantas status. It's not just about starting at the bottom with Virgin or whoever the airline is. It's also a case of every every flight or purchase that I send across to airline B is a flight purchase that is no longer counting to me retaining my primary status. So there's now a risk that by trying out the second, the second airline, I'm, I'm whether I want to try them out and don't want to put all my eggs in one basket, I'm almost forced to do so anyway, because if I give too many flights to this new player, I'm going to miss out on retaining my old status. So it's a big step. I mean, we call it the golden handcuffs, right? You know, that the, the, the term makes a lot of sense. Um, but when we think about 13 years ago to now, Bill, you know, and obviously, you know, with, with Status Match and all the rest of it, the, the technology is there now. You mentioned Keith as well. We can detect fraud. We can process more quickly. We can scale, you know, in ways that, and, you know, even be even more innovative than we could be 13 years ago. I mean, when you think about all of those things combined, um, you know, from both the business perspective, uh, I'll put that to you, Phil, and maybe Keith, from the frequent flyer perspective, you know, that passenger who's thinking about switching, now that we have the technology and the ability today to do things that we couldn't do 13 years ago, you know, how do you feel about things sort of now, you know, what would you have done differently 13 years ago if you had this technology today? Cool. Phil, I'll get you to start on the business side. From the business, uh, if, uh, man, it would have changed the game. If, if we had been able to process, like, the results were stunning, with the with the with the process we had, right? But we did know that we probably lost half of the people through through just just the, the just the poor process. Um, mm-hmm. If you, you start doubling the results of this stuff, and it really was groundbreaking. Um, so that's yeah. If if I could have if I could have um, outsourced it, like with with fraud protections and process quickly, it really would have changed the game. And and the key point, it would have protected the team, um, enabled them to focus yeah. on what's important to them. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's all well and good for us to say, you know, well, we know we lost X percentage of people because we took too long with them, but there's a lot of zeros involved 
um, you know, when we're talking about alien frequent fire programs and co-brand revenue and things like that. So even a, even a small percentage of a reduction in terms of churn of incoming, you know, incoming potential matchees, I mean, that's, that's very large volumes of dollars that we're talking about here. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually don't want to think about it. No, no, no. Yeah, massive. I know. You know. It's kind of a little scary when <laughs> you think about like, Keith, Keith, from the, you know, from, from the coalface point of view, you know, uh, What's your, what's your sort of your view if, if you had today's technology to be able to do what you did 13 years ago? Oh, it would definitely have removed a lot of um, administrative burden for for the team. So instead of instead of don't get me wrong, I I love it. I loved interacting with our customers at the lounge. I love like talking to them and you know finding out what what they like about the new program and seeing the excitement they have about the new features, but was it the best use of um you know the the team's time probably not and so we with a lot of digitization that that you have today um you could get customers to you know do a lot of um uh like to status match themselves with self service mm-hmm. um using you know api technology um we we could for instance do instant verification of of the other airlines and frequent flyer status um we we could you know we could even provide that human face to it we um the reason why we had to support our lounge staff with with the velocity team was because they they were physically unable to absorb the additional um capacity um during a during a i, I saw what happened when during a disrupt it was just all hands on deck and mm-hmm. and the entire lounge was just you know overwhelmed so with with the technology we have today, um, it would have enabled you know our lounge staff to um, you know like help out our, our, our customers a bit more, um, remove a lot of the, that that burden, um, and and the other the other point was that it was it was a very extremely manual um, process. You had to you had to wait for your cart to come through the system, whereas today. Um, we we can instantly you know upload a new or up, update your your card um, in in your app, um, and so it would have been it would have you know there would have been like next to no processing time at all. Yeah, that that's a good point. When I think about it, that's right. Everything's on the app now. I mean, you know, I mean, I still occasionally like to to have a, a physical frequent flyer card. I mean, sometimes you are someplace in the world and the lounge still wants to see your physical card or a check in or, or what have you, but. You know, nine out of ten times now, whether we're talking about lounge check-in or whatever else, it's just on the phone. I um, mean, even at the physical check-in counter now, you know, gone are the days that you need to put down your ID and your frequent flyer card um, on the counter. You just, you really don't um, anymore. Everything is there. And even if you wanted to change your number in the system because it's not in there or something like that, it's on the phone. Here you go. Um, you know, often with the barcode that can just be scanned. The, the fraud verification, as you say, nowadays can just be done instantly in the background or close to instantly in the background. So you can eliminate 99% of it. And, and more importantly, you eliminate the time associated with trying to do those verifications. So I can only imagine what this, uh, what this campaign would have looked like, um, you know, if it was run, uh, if it was run, you know, with these, uh, you know, with, with, with these friction reducing uh, extra capabilities. Um We've covered a lot. I really appreciate uh, the input from from both of you. And I know we've only just scratched the surface. To me, this is a fascinating story. I mean, I recall it. I I was very excited to be able to talk to you guys about it, Um, you know, and and, and when we sort of agreed, hey, let's let's, let's talk about this. This is going to be a fun topic to talk about. Um, It really was a fun and exciting time. Keith, I think everything you said was really right. It it was, there was a buzz. There was, even for people that weren't involved, you know, or didn't match across, you know, just, in the industry at the time, everybody was excited. I mean, Australia is a two airline country, you know, no offense to the other airlines that keep trying and, and with limited success here and there. But the reality is it's a two airline country uh, with a small population and people people got excited. Even those people that just took one family vacation a year or every two years, they were, they were excited by this at the time. Um, Phil... You're going to be in London at Loyalty Summit, I believe. So um, for those for those that are coming along to Loyalty Summit in London on the 5th and 6th of June, um, feel free to hit Phil up if you want to learn more or um, ask him questions to, to follow up from this or, or, or about more about the Virgin Australia. 
um, campaign. I um, Again, I think it was a fascinating campaign. I think it was a fascinating time um, and all the rest of it. Thank you both for joining um, and um, I look forward to speaking to you both again soon. Thank you. Thank you.